And welcome to Wednesday night Bible study here at Expedition Church of the Triad. Amen. Glory to God. Glad to have you with us. And uh, you can go ahead and share your uh, your feed. I know that Dick is watching. Hallelujah. Well, glad to have you all tonight. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Let's just jump right on in here. Praise God. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14. Um, Julie got put in a soft cast this week. So uh, four more weeks without putting weight on it, and then four weeks of therapy after that. So hallelujah. But she's, you know, she's out, of, out of the hard cast now. Praise the Lord. Okay. Looking here, we're reading what uh, Peter writes. As obedient children, not fashioning, or fashioning yourselves according to your former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Now, we know this. We've, we've shared this before. The word conversation in the King James is, is um, in, in relation to your lifestyle, how you live, the way you live, the manner you live, okay? And so... Here, when he says that, he's talking about, you know, in all manner of conduct, how you live, how you conduct yourself, um, praise it, not talking. <laughs> you know, we talk about conversation. We're thinking of talking about talking. But here in, in, the, in this era and the way the word was used, it is in the manner with which you conduct yourself, okay? So it's interesting. Um, he says, as, as he which called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conduct. Now, uh, before I move on, I, I don't think we can just run past that and not at least acknowledge that there's a, there's a lot in the church right now that does not uh, acquiesce to that sentiment because they're trying to come up with a narrative that says it doesn't matter what I do, how I conduct myself, how I live, because I'm under grace. Now, I know that's the extreme, but there's a lot of that extreme being preached, you know, and, and a lot of people... Um, or walking away from, you know, and, and I understand you can teach something and people walk away with it and go and share it wrong. People did that with faith. But this is so widespread uh, that, you know, it, it is a, it's a problem. Uh, people, you know, go into churches and they don't ever deal with anything. They've never addressed anything. It's, it's just live the way you want to live because you're under grace. Well, that's not biblical. Now, neither is the works of the law. They're not biblical either. But there is um, the command, and this is, this is not a request, this is a commandment. You know, see, you know, people, people try to read and not take a hold, and they'll say something like, um, love is the only commandment. Well, I can go throughout the New Testament and point to you all kinds of commandments that are not the law of love. Okay? Um, so we just, we, we have to take the hold, we can't be so... Um, caught up with a narrative that we will undermine the teaching with the wrong interpretation of it. All right. And so um, we're to live holy. I mean, that, that is what we're, we're called to do. Amen. You notice he said in the previous verse, not fashioning, hallelujah, or conforming yourselves according to the former lust. Huh? You get saved and you just keep, you know, and you're, okay, sorry to keep living like you did because, you know, you're already pre-forgiven. Uh, right. Okay. Then verse 16. But because it is written, because it is written. Notice he says here, for um, he that called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conduct because, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, now we will face a, a, a judgment before God and be judged on things. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to go to hell, but there's going to be reward loss. There's going to, you know, it's, it's, there'll be a penalty for living any way you want to, even though you may make it into heaven, as we call it, by the skin of your teeth. Okay, all right, 
you know, you, you, you know, the ones who've done right are going to be blessed more. Okay. Um, then he says it's past the time of your sojourning here in fear. You know, we, in other words, we don't want to displease God. And this isn't my sermon tonight. It's not living holy. <laughs> just, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conduct or vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So he, he, bring, he talks about living holy and being holy because God is holy and not to live after your lust according to the former conversation. Um, God, God judges, but he says all this and says, you are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. There was a great price paid for our redemption. Hallelujah. A great price paid. And because we are purchased. Now, when we come into the kingdom of God, the access to coming has been purchased. The doorway by which we enter was purchased. It just, you just don't get to go in there just because you, you, know, you, you, know, uh, you woke up one day and there was nothing out there for you. You just say, I'm going to go be a, be a Christian. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to be a believer. Um, no blood has been shed. Nothing's been done. But I'm, I get to just go because that's what I want to do. It doesn't work that way. God had to make provision, and it was a great price paid for that provision. Hallelujah. It was, it, was, <clears throat> it was not an easy thing to do. It was so heavy that Jesus, even at the cross, said, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So we cannot make a mockery of the work of Christ, the blood of Jesus, Amen. By living our life as if no price was paid. So what, what do I say about being paid? We're purchased. Okay. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Now King James uses the word peculiar, but you know, a peculiar people. But it means purchased. You're bought with a price. And that price was the blood of Jesus. Amen. And it's the precious blood of Jesus. Webster's just defines precious as highly valuable, costly, highly esteemed, cherished, praise God, beloved, praise God. His, his blood is highly valuable. It was costly. It's highly esteemed. Glory to God. It's cherished by the Father. It's beloved by the Father because it is on the mercy seat of God. Hallelujah. And so we have this precious blood that we're redeemed by. And so what's the importance of that blood? Now, you, you know, when we kind of, you know, come at this, if you just kind of come at it and on the surface, um, you may have a, a surfacey evaluation of what, what that's all about, but it's deep, okay? It goes much deeper than some kind of type of, you know, uh, well, you know, thank God for the blood of Jesus, and you really don't know what it means. I, mean, I grew up Pentecostal, and we would plead the blood. And you, if you ever ask anybody what it meant, they, they couldn't tell you. Most, it, now, the previous generations, I'm sure, had a revelation, because that's where it came from, you know. Um, and really, it's I plead my case based on the blood of, of, of what the blood of Jesus has procured for me, Okay. And so they're pleading their case on the, on the fact that the blood of Jesus guarantees their rights, hallelujah, to the answer for what they need there. Amen? And uh, so, the, you know, we, but we, we can't get, get catchphrases sometimes, and those catchphrases will become more valuable and more important than the understanding or the significance behind them. Now, I know a few years ago somebody came out with one, and if, if, if you like this person, that's fine. I don't dislike them. I just don't like this particular phrase. New, new, uh, new level, new devil. Well, what a dumb thing to start saying. You know, I mean, you go up higher and, and, and people start quoting that all the time. New level, new devil. Well, you're really putting a whole lot of magnification on the devil. Now, we don't need to be stupid. Amen. 
You know, the, the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But I'm not going to come up with a catchphrase that, that magnifies the devil. Okay? I, I, just, I don't think it's smart. And you'll get more focused on, well, the problems I'm going through is, you know, I got to a newer place in God. Now the, the devil's come bigger than it was before. You're, the way you deal with it is the exact same. You deal with it with the word. You deal with it with your authority. Hallelujah. And, you know, it doesn't matter what devil they show up. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So Satan himself, he don't send a little imp, and he don't send a principality, and he don't send a power, and he doesn't send a ruler of the darkness to this world. He shows up himself. It doesn't matter. Because the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the word of God are still have authority over him. And the greater one's in you. So I'm, I don't need to come up with a different weapon. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to go from, you know, um, an M16 to a 50 cal. Because i got a bigger devil to deal with. No. It's the same word. The same Spirit of God, the greater one on the inside of you. The same blood of Jesus. We overcome by the word, uh, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. What's the word of our testimony to be? What the word says. Amen? And besides that, the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, whoever liveth to make intercession for us. Amen. So um, people just love this stuff. They love, they love these catchphrases. And, and, you know, and not really understanding what they're saying. Okay? Hallelujah. I remember a number of years ago, a guy came up with teaching on the Merriamos. I can't remember what the word, Greek word Merriamos meant. But people walk around they, after the sermon are, you know, looking at you. Because I was out of town. I hadn't been out of town that one. Sometimes they would have meetings in our church, and I was, out, I was on vacation. And, uh, sorry, you know, when I'm working in the restaurant, when I was working at the restaurant, I got one week of vacation. Guess what? I went somewhere. Amen? I mean, you know, if we're having a meeting and the only time you ever, you ever you get a vacation the whole year is happen to be in that meeting and that's just it, go on vacation. You can watch, this, you watch the service after it. Okay? And uh, I came back and they were going, have you heard of the Mary Moose? I said, everybody was doing that, coming up to you going, have you heard about the Mary Moose? No. What, it, what does Mary, Mary have the most of? <laughs> you know? And uh, we, we try to be so deep. Okay? And even though some things are deep or they're deeper in understanding whatever, we don't have to try to be deep. Okay? Or, in, in all reality, we were trying to prove to everybody that we had deeper knowledge than they had about something. About Mary. Okay. Now, I'm going to live by faith. I'm going to speak the word. I'm going to love Jesus. I'm going to walk in the being covered in the blood. So you marry me your own way on out of here. If there's revelation in it, I'll take it. Amen? But I don't have to act like, man, you know. I'm going to hit another sacred cow in the charismatic world. Remember one hour of prayer. And there was this teaching, if you, you know, you had to pray an hour. Hello. And they had these steps you took. And everybody was, you know, and let me say something. If you go into prayer and you're, you, you got the clock set to make sure you pray this long about this one and this long about that one, that long about this one, you're missing the mark. Okay? And Jesus, Je they took Jesus. We Could you not pray at least one hour? Okay. Um, and he wasn't setting a time limit on prayer. They just fell asleep. Hello. In a, in a very important time. Amen. So we, we, we got to uh, kind of kick over some of our charismatic sacred cows and stop getting caught up in stuff. And even as Pentecostals, we, we love the blood of Jesus, but just saying, I plead the blood, we need to know what we're talking about. We need to understand the importance of the blood. Amen. And instead of just kind of you know, flipping something out there that grandma said. 
Okay? All right. So we plead our case on the basis of what the blood of Jesus guarantees and has procured for us. Okay? That's simple. But you, at least you have an understanding what you, when you say, I plead the blood, you at least you understand what you're talking about. Instead of some magic wand. All right. Because faith begins with the will of God is known, not suspicious of. All right? And so what is the importance of blood? Number one, the importance of the blood is this, substitution. That is the key to the working of the blood of Jesus. It is the substitution. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. We'll read from verses uh, 19 through 26. It says, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, According to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things <clears throat> in the heavens, the, pa the tabernacle was the pattern, okay, should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves would better sacrifices than these. Oh, praise God. Can you say amen? So notice he says that the tabernacle is the um, pattern. We look at the tabernacle and it's a pattern. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And it said that because it's the pattern, it had to be cleansed. Well, because we're looking at typology. We're looking at types that are visual in the natural that they could look at and gain understanding of what's going on in the spirit. And so here, when they went into the temple with the blood of goats and calves, hallelujah, are you here? And um, began to do the service in the tabernacle and ultimately the temple with that blood, it was a symbol. It was, it was doing on the pattern what was actually going to take place in heaven. So it was a type and a foreshadowing. That's going to bug me if it sits out there like that, so I'm going to move it. Hallelujah. I'm not too OCD, but it will bug me. <laughs> okay. Hallelujah. That was unprofessional. But it's out of my way now. It's not going to bug me. All right. And so then it says, but the heavenly things had to be done with greater or better than these. Now, we know from later on that, that um, Paul writes here in Hebrews, and again, I, I'm, a, I'm not a hardcore, but I'm a believer that Paul wrote Hebrews um, for my own personal beliefs. That he entered in not with the blood of bulls and calves or the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, but with his own blood. Hallelujah. And so here we have, in stating um, that, you know, that the patterns must be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, hallelujah, to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enter, in, enter into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice un, of himself. So here we have the, the book of Hebrews bringing a closure um, to 
and understanding to the priesthood and the law and the sacrificial system of the, of, of the, of the Jews as to the purpose. <coughs> <coughs> and it was not going to be an, a, a perpetual priesthood in the natural. Because Christ is entered in how often? And for all. Once and for all to obtain an eternal redemption for us. Glory to God. And so <coughs> this blood, see, blood had to be shed. Now, what could fully redeem man? Animal blood couldn't do it. Animal blood could, now we'll read this later, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Animal blood could cover And apparently the approximate timetable of that covering was a year. Because next Passover, you had to do it again. <coughs> it was a yearly thing. You had to do it every year. And those sins were put off for another year. And we'll get into other sacrifices in, in, a, in a little while. And the, the different types. And so... This was an atoning. And when we look at the Old Testament scriptures, they talk about atoning to cover. But see, the blood of Jesus didn't cover. It washed. Amen. So when, when, the, when, the, when the sacrifices were made, the high priest went in. And then they did their service in the holy place. But then once uh, and, uh, every year and by himself, the high priest went into the holiest of all or we refer to also as the Holy of Holies, through that six-inch thick, 40-foot high, 60-foot wide woven material. You just didn't pick it up. It's not, a, it's not a drape. You just didn't pick it up and throw it over your shoulder. Now, there's, there's, the belief is that he was supernaturally transferred through the, 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 the veil into the holy place, but they had a rope tied to his leg. Because if he wasn't right, he got drug out. <laughs> okay? And then he had, you remember, he had the pomegranate and the bell, the pomegranate and the bell, the pomegranate and the bell on, on the hem of his garment. So they could hear him in there chinging along. But it was also the bell, the, the pomegranate tempered the bell. So you didn't have this clanging. It was a tempered, you know, you, you're taking that sound and it was tempered by, the, by hitting the pomegranate. It wasn't clangy, tingy. Okay? It was, it, was, it was the bells, and you heard the bells more distinctly they, because you didn't have them banging against each other and offsetting the, you know, their sound. It was, it was tempered, okay? And you see, the love of God tempers the power of God. Hallelujah. Amen? You know, you just give people all power, and they'll go crazy with it. So you need love. Let everything be done in love. Amen? Amen? We have to do it in love. Glory to God. So... He went in with a, so the priest went in every year with a substitutionary sacrifice. Now you go back and think about in Leviticus that when they were, they were getting ready to uh, pronounce the sins of the nations, they, they had, we even call it the scapegoat. Okay? And, you know, um, they would take that goat and they would, the high priest would pronounce, and see there was one that was sacrificed where the blood was taken in, and there was another that all the sins were pronounced on it of the people, and it was let go in the wilderness where the judgment of God hit it, came on it. It wasn't the same. It wasn't the blood for that one because it was. There was another one. So there, there was one for, for the the uh, covering, and one for the you know taking the sins away. It was symbolic of taking the sins away. That's why Isaiah says that uh, Jesus knew us. Uh, Jesus went in and took care of this. In Isaiah fifty five in his death. Now King James says death. It's plural in the Greek Hebrew deaths. Okay, because he was both the scapegoat and the sacrificial goat. Okay, hallelujah. And uh, he entered in with our, his blood for us, but it was for once and for all. Leviticus 17, 11 says, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement, remember, a covering, an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the souls. Well, thank God God had a plan in to hold things together. Um, Genesis 3.21, unto, unto Adam, 
Also in his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the animals were sacrificed. Okay? So under the, under the Mosaic law, there were five different types of offerings. Three of them were what we call uh, voluntary. Two of them were involuntary. The voluntary offerings, which represented praise, worship, um, honor, communion with God, burnt, peace, and meal. These were three, three, three different types of voluntary. You did not have to do them. It was voluntary. Worship, praising, spending time in God's presence is voluntary. You don't have to do it. If you love him, you will. <laughs> but you don't have to do it. Then the involuntary. What's involuntary mean? You got to do it. Okay? You had the sin offering, which was for the sin nature, and then the trespass offering, which was, which was for the acts of sin. These were both blood, blood sacrifice offerings. <coughs> blood had to be shed for these. Now, these, all these offerings would take place in between Passovers. The people would come, and they would bring their voluntary offerings as, as um, worship and praise to God. Then the involuntary, when they were, you know, sinning and whatever else, they, they came and, and brought sacrifice in between. And then, of course, every year they had to bring the, had to bring the, the, spot, the spotless lamb for, for sacrifice on Passover. All right? And so these offerings were in place and instituted all the time. We, we, we offer God, uh, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Remember that song, little chorus? We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. And, uh, and listen, sometimes, you know, it is sacrifice. Because you don't feel like it. But you tell your flesh what to do, don't you? Amen. So this precious blood of Christ, what, what um, do we get out of this or what happens because of this? Well, number one, we're justified. We are declared righteous by his blood. Romans 5, 9 says, much more than being now justified or declared righteous. The word justification and being made righteous are basically the, the same thing. They convey the same meaning. Now, we like justify because we can say, preach a sermon and say, it's just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. Just as if I'd, okay, never sinned, which is true because it is just as if I'd never sinned. Okay? We don't have one for just as if you'd never sinned, okay? So we're declared righteous. Hallelujah. Um, Romans 5, 9, more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, folks, wrath will come on the earth. Now, God's giving lots of opportunity. The, uh, the husband waiteth. Behold, the husband waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. Hallelujah. And hath long patience for it until they receive both the former and the latter rain. Amen? Because God hath long. He wants to bring the harvest in. He wants to bring the people in. Hallelujah. And so we need to have that same heart. That we want to bring the harvest in. I mean, there's a lot of crazy out there right now. And getting crazier. And sometimes you look out there and it's crazy on steroids. All right? But we, we've got to be light and darkness. Salt in the earth. Hallelujah. Have compassion for humanity. And bring the truth to them. Praise God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17 through 21. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Who's got the ministry of reconciliation? Preachers? Every believer. Hallelujah. Well, what's that? Well, to wit or to know that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors in Christ's stead. 
I'm sorry. Uh, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him sin who knew no sin, or sin for us who knew no sin. I did leave the words to be out on purpose, to be out on purpose, because they're not in the original Greek. They're at about a translators for the purpose of clarification of the text flow, but they're not there. So if I read it without them, I'm not changing anything. I'm changing what some guy decided thought ought to be there. Okay. Well, just because, you know, I mean, how about if somebody just took the Declaration of Independence and put in there something that, you know, thinks it ought to be there? Well, it don't make it right, does it? And I'm not going to read it just because put, somebody put it in there. You know, took, the, the, took a copy of the, uh, better yet, the Constitution, and then, you know, wrote in there something he thought should be in there but wasn't in there. And I don't have to follow that. The only way I have to follow some, some of them is if there is an amendment to the Constitution. They went through the constitutional amendment process. Okay? And then it becomes part of the Constitution. All right? So the translators put the words to be, but the words to be are not there. So he hath made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now this is where substitution really is. He became sin for us, you know, he took our sin now, he, he took our sin, became the sacrificial lamb, became the scapegoat, took our sins, they were judged, and the blood was placed on the mercy seat for our, not no longer atonement, but redemption. Amen. And we, in turn, when we come into Christ, get his righteousness. Now, righteousness is an old Elizabethan term that simply translated means in right relationship or right standing with. See, we come into right standing with God through redemption, through substitution. You know, another term used for this is identification. Okay? He identified with us, and now we identify with him in his resurrected state. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so he became sin for us who knew no sin. In other words, Jesus never sinned. Yet he became sin for us that God's judgment could come. He could bear the judgment. His blood was shed for life of the flesh is in the blood. And his blood was given that we could be purchased and covered and sealed by the blood of the lamb. Glory to God. And it's on the mercy seat of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah 118 says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, and though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Hallelujah. And so it's not just simply a covering of our sin. There is a removal of it. Praise God. Can you say hallelujah? If my buddy Fawaz was uh, watching right now, uh, he would be saying Skilly Bunda. I don't know where Fawaz got Skilly Bunda from, but it's, well, anyway, we used it. Hallelujah. He's, Ephesians 1 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now think, the riches of his grace redeemed us by the blood of Jesus, it did not come so we could keep living the way we were. How rich is the grace of God that God made a provision to be completely transformed and translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his, of, his, of his dear son to be washed of our sin, to be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That grace of God, made it was rich. It was not there so you can run around and live like a dog in heat. Thank you for your enthusiasm. And then talk about I'm pre-forgiven and it don't matter what I do and all that stupid stuff. You, you uh, turn the grace of God into lascivious, lasciviousness or lasciviousness. 
Lasciviousness means lasciviousness, which means wantonness, unbridled. Okay? Using the grace of God to be unbridled, or really, a false narrative on the grace of God to be unbridled, to live outside the parameters of God's moral code and what God wants and how he wants you to live. All right? Praise God. That's still good preaching even if you don't like it. Um, and then Colossians 1, 17, almost verbatim Paul writes here. Uh, he wrote it. So it's, it's the Bible repeats it. I could write a letter and use the same phrase. I use the same phrase all the time. I use SOS. Stupid on steroids. I may use it in this case, and I may use it over here, and I might use it somewhere else. I've used it for years. Okay? Doesn't mean I'm copying. It's, it, it's a good phrase. There's people I've been around that are stupid on steroids. All right. But he says in Colossians 1 14, the same thing. Whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. It's by the blood of Jesus. No man can absolve your sin. See, the, the, the earthly priesthood ceased. When Christ on the cross said, it is finished, and gave up the ghost, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, signifying that the way to God was no longer through a temple made by the hands of men. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that's what it, that's what it was. In other words, the Levitical priesthood was over. And a new priest, after a different order, had taken, was going to take control. After he, after he was raised up from the dead, he would be known as a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, not after the order of Aaron. Amen. The priesthood of Jesus is not the Levitical priesthood. It's after Melchizedek. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And the Bible even goes as far to say that the, the, the Levites, or Aaron, okay, paid tithe to Melchizedek while he was yet in the loins of his father Abraham. So the less, the lesser is blessed of the greater. Amen? The priesthood of Melchizedek is a higher priesthood than the priesthood of Aaron. Or we could call it the Levitical, Levitical priesthood. Because it was the tribe of Levi that took the priesthood. Amen? And so Jesus becomes a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Praise God. He's, he's the high priest. Now remember, <clears throat> this is before the law. Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek before the law. Tithe is just under the law. Ask Abraham. Amen. And who's Jesus the priest forever after? The order of Melchizedek. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. Meaning what? We being the seed of Abraham, he paid tithe to Melchizedek. We pay tithe to he who is after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus. For Hebrew says, there he receiveth them. Amen. What? The tithe. Tithing is as spiritual as it is not as much as, as, as much as it is natural. There's a spiritual law behind it. Hallelujah. It's not required um, in the sense that, you know, you've got to pay your tithe, you're going to hell. But tithing was before the law, during the law, and after the law. Amen. God's always had it. All right? We know, it's, it's, at least from the time of Abraham, we've had the tithe. Before the law. Because Moses got the law. Not Abraham. And Moses is down the line. He went up before Abraham. He's down the line. Y'all here, you go home. How many are still here? Rita's here. Ellie's here. Dick's here. Steve and Marion are here. Joe's here. Who's out there? Daniel, are you still out there online? He was out there earlier. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so um, Acts 20, 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves 
and, and this is talking about the minute, uh, right, and talking to ministers, and to all the flock of which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, ministers need to be aware of their heavy responsibility because they've been commanded to feed the church of God, the flock of God, because he purchased them with his blood. In other words, your oversight is over a valuable possession of God. And you do disservice to teach them out of line with Scripture, to preach your narrative or how you feel about something or things that you can't support because it's popular and, and brings, puts butts in the seats and money in the coffers. Hello. Now, we want people in the seats, and we need money to operate the church. But you can't do disservice to them and modify things because it'll get more of that instead of training them up in the way that they should go, to make disciples of them, to teach them to do what the Word of God says and live according to the Word of God. You can't, you can't sacrifice your high responsibility to feed the flock of God because he purchased it with his own blood because you want to have the status, the status of being a large church with a lot of people and a lot of money, yada, 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 yada. So ministers, you have a responsibility. Amen. And you cannot. Well, I got more people, so therefore I'm right. That, the Mormons have got a lot of people. And we know they're wrong. Jehovah's Witnesses get people in there all the time. Hello? They don't, even know that, they don't even believe Jesus is the Son of God. They believe he's a Son of God. Him and Lucifer. Now, now the, the Mormons believe that him and Lucifer are brothers. Well, that's messed up. Lucifer was not called the, the illegitimate stepbrother of Jesus or anything. He was called the anointed cherub at the covered, but he fell. He got lifted up in pride and fell. So there are, there are organizations that call, call themselves Christian, but they're pseudo-Christian, false. They have a lot of people. Just having people is not a sign that you're right. And not having a lot of people is not a sign you're wrong. Amen? You, you, and you can't look at those things. That's where the... The world judges success by um, how big your company is and how much money you have and the stockholders you got in there and, you know, and all the imagery. You can have a greatly organized and marketed company and be junk. Hello. I mean, be absolute junk. I've gone in restaurants like that. You go in there and they're a chain restaurant and you're thinking, my God, I'll never go in there again. That's terrible. And you go to some little mom and pop shop that's got, you know, barely, I mean, barely gets by every week. But they're awesome. There's a little place at High Point, Alex's uh, house. It is a hole in the wall. Hey, anybody ever been there? Y'all been there? Okay. Got four parking places in the front. You got to go through this narrow a little drive to get to the back to where there's more parking. There's another 10 spaces back there. And that's all it's going to hold. About 14 cars is full. All right? <laughs> it's good. I mean, they got ham steak. Their grits are great. Amen. I mean, they, and they, they, they be right, there, right there where you can see them cooking. They're cooking right there in front of you. You can sit on the counter and, 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 eat, and cook, eat and order. Now, um, don't sit at the tables next to the, where, the, where the cooking is because they're, they're skinnier. And you'll have your belly laying on the table. Okay? We <laughs> slid another day. I went, I can't eat like this, Jamie. <laughs> so we went and found another table <laughs> thinking, that ain't going to work because I'm going to be eating and my stomach's going to start going out. <laughs> and it's going to be laying up over on top of there before I get done. But they've got good food. You got some chain restaurants, you know, they charge you four times as much to eat in there, and you walk out going, it ain't that good. I mean, we go in there at Alex's and get, I get the three eggs. They're the same as two, by the way, they advertise. 
Three eggs for the same price as two. I said, why am I going to get two? I'm going to get three. With cheese on them, you know, scrambled with cheese on them, grits, whole wheat toast, a ham steak. You know, we drink water. And uh, we walk out of there with tip, $18. I can go over to this new fancy place on Wendover. I won't, I won't use the name. That you know, but they, they claim to be the primary before anybody else place. First, <laughs> and my meal would be almost eighteen dollars. Okay, and we you can go into Alex's, walk in and be out the door in twenty minutes. I mean, like. We just ordered. Here's the food. And it's fresh. Like, I mean, it's cooked. It's hot. It's not, had been sitting up there for 20 minutes. And with a tip, 18 bucks, I'm out the door. Oh, yeah. Amen. So success cannot be measured in terms of how big. There's another hot place over in High Point, the Biscuit Factory. Now, all the locals call it BFAC. They don't call it Biscuit Factory. They call it BFAC. And they got biscuits about that big around. If they ever tried to build bigger, they they wouldn't work. That old ragged out place works. So when it comes to churches, don't fall for the, the the fluff and the puff and the advertising, and the imagery. And let that drive you more than truth. And ministers, pastors, preachers. Don't sell out to the world's narrative of success at the expense of truth. It's not worth it because the people that you're supposed to be ministering to have been purchased by God's own blood. It's a great price. So we have a great risk. You had to get to a restaurant back. I see I did that, didn't I? I went from here to the restaurant's back. Because they were examples of what I'm talking about. The world says success means one thing, but that's not true. Cannot fall into the trap of what the world says about success and think that means that if you're, you know, if, if my church is big, then for I'm successful. Well, according to the world, you are. But if you, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm off. I think I'm missing a light up here. I just noticed that light's out. I just noticed it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, we'll, we'll, tell, we'll, we'll, we'll violate the Word of God with marriage of, of, of uh, same-sex couples. Well, they're, not, they're homosexual. Okay? They'll, they'll, they'll violate the Word of God. They'll, adorn, or they'll ordain uh, people who are living in adultery, who are living in homosexuality and lesbianism and uh, violating the Word of God because they want success. Amen? It's, a, it's all good. Um, see, at what price? Now remember, you're putting in front of your people and their children. You're putting in front of them things and and condoning it and affirming it in violation to your charge amen over the flock of god which he per god made you overseers to feed the church of god which he purchased with his own blood that's a pr that's a great price that you, for you to go in and start messing with Hello. In an area that you don't have right to mess with. You cannot teach people to violate the word of God and be feeding them. So what are you going to give them? You're going to give them a worldly narrative. Is what, what? Remember this, that the spirit of disobedience now operates in the children of disobedience. Or really, the spirit of antichrist operates in the children of disobedience. Those people in the world are operating under an antichrist spirit. And the blood of Jesus was shed to deliver them. Yet they come into our churches and because of the world narrative 
and success narrative and wanting to be famous narrative and be popular narrative, we will violate the very word of God that we're supposed to be preaching and affirm and condone and put up with all the stuff that the word of God says they shouldn't be doing. Under the guise of worldly love. Because it's not unconditional love. Because unconditional love would pay the price to tell the truth no matter what it cost. Amen. Well, I'm glad y'all enjoyed that. I, I, I can feel the enthusiasm. Hallelujah. Now, there is forgiveness by his blood. First John 1 John 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with another, one another, <coughs> one with another. I'm sorry. You know, remember King Jimmy? He's kind of like Yoda. <laughs> it's not all in the right order sometimes. We have fellowship one with another. Um, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So there's forgiveness by his blood. Our conscience is purged by his blood. I'm going to try to finish this up. I don't want to carry this over. I'm going to have to carry this over. <laughs> So I'm going to stop. I'm going to kind of stop. I'm just going to kind of wrap up in here. I, I thought I, had, I was about to finish. I am not. I got more than I, more notes than I started with. I have more left over than I've covered. How about that? So think, when we talk about the blood of Jesus, we have forgiveness and we have redemption in that blood. Hallelujah. So there's this great price that is paid. Hallelujah. For humanity to be delivered and to be redeemed to God. Is not something to be toyed with. Amen? So, pastors, traveling ministers, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, lay ministers, whoever, whatever, exhorters, whatever word you want to come up with, bishop, the archbishop, okay, chief apostle, uh, you know, and all kinds, you know, we got all kinds of names, you know, super delicate, super delicate. Whatever, got all kinds of titles now. There's titles out there. I thought that's not in the Bible. <laughs> you know, um, we don't. We, you know, we don't have. You know, uh, but anyway, some some of those titles are just out there. You know, um, no matter what your title, we don't have the right to disregard. The purchased and our responsibilities to feed the purchased the truth because for your redemption a great price was paid and it's by, is our uh, responsibility that's been in, where we have uh, received it's incumbent upon us is to feed the flock of God the truth yeah. amen. amen and so when we realize how valuable you are. God, God sees you so valuable and so important because you've been redeemed by his blood. He tells his ministers, you, you feed them because I purchased them. Now, I, behind that to me is a stern warning. You take care of my people properly. Amen. You don't get to play with it. It's the way I said. It. It's God's way of the highway, really. It really is. You don't get to choose, I don't like that. Tough! It don't work that way. Amen? All right, let's, take up, let's, let's receive tonight's offering. We'll pick up next week. We'll talk about um, conscience being purged, the new covenant in his blood, victory in the blood. Hallelujah. Amen. If you need an offering envelope, they're on the seat backs in front of you. If you're, um, if you're giving electronically, you know, the cash app and um, uh, PayPal, they're available. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, it was, um, it was a nice Sunday when we had the fellowship, and um, we wanted to go get tables. We weren't out there traipsing through the muddy, sloshy mulch. We were walking on the sidewalks. That was nice. And we're going to get rid of the, the, the retention wall there uh, with the concrete's holding the wall. We're going to fill that up with, with backfill and 
put mulch on top of it so it'll it, and kind of redirect the water. Um, but uh, we gotta get some we gotta get some backfill around all the concrete out here that we put in because it's it's a little high. And we'll just we'll put diverters out, but we'll we'll take care. I mean, it's, that's part of the process. Amen. Uh, this it's more work than it is like cost. It's more back than it is cost. You know. So if you're good with a shovel, even if you're not good with a shovel, we'll use you now. Uh, uh, Father, in Jesus' name, we pray. We thank you for the people as they give. We thank you. You bless them. Heaven's windows are open under them, and you pour out blessings that don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Those that are joining us, we thank you for watching us here at Expedition Church of the Triad. We bless you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for uh, being a part of our service. If you want to be with us in person, we invite you to come to 6302 Walter Wright Road, Pleasant Garden, North Carolina, 27313. Love to have you in our service. Uh, at Expedition Church of the Triad. Until we meet again, praise God. Remember these words in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever, <laughs> oh man, cannot believe I went that blank. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whatsoever, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, this is the victory that overcometh the world. That don't sound right to me. Huh? Even our faith. Amen. I'm just thinking, what did I leave out? And you, I can't, you listen, there's times when you get you lose stuff, and you may have said it a thousand times, but once you lost it, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Hallelujah! The one time I needed to pass six months to have it up there, it wasn't up there. <laughs> Hallelujah! Amen. Praise God. Join us next time. See you then. Praise God. Good night.